Welcome to our second instalment of Jeffwood Executive Recruitment Trust, where we are speaking with Gold Coast CEOs about their business, how they view the current business climate, and what's ahead for them in 2020. Today we are speaking with Jonathan Fisher, who's the current CEO of National Trust Australia, Queensland. Welcome, Jonathan. Good afternoon. Hello. Thank you for allowing us the time to speak to you about the National Trust and also about your experiences as a CEO of the business as well. My pleasure. I want to begin by asking you about the National Trust of Queensland, or National Trust of Australia, Queensland, and just what it's all about. So we are an independent of government, membership-based charity. Uh, we're associated with the, the global brand of the National Trust, which was formed over 100 years ago in the UK. Um, and we have a very simple mission. We're all about uh, protecting, conserving, celebrating Queensland's environmental, built and cultural heritage. Excellent. I understand that you were previously the CEO of Crum Wildlife Sanctuary mm -hmm. and you took on the role five years ago as with the National Trust. I understand also that um, before you took on the role or when you took on the role with Crum Wildlife Sanctuary there was a real agenda for change and I wanted to ask you about that agenda for change and how successful you were driving that change and has it been similar with the National Trust, has it been a real agenda for change? Well, first of all, the, the National Trust has owned Crom and Wildlife Sanctuary since 1976, and that is generally not a well-known um, story, mm. if you like. Mm. Um, and one of the first things that I had to deal with was to address an audience, a uh, fairly hostile audience in Corumbin, I think it's the second or third night I was here, who were intent on effectively kicking the National Trust out of the Crom and Wildlife Sanctuary. So two days into the job, in a public hall uh, with a fairly angry community who didn't think the National Trust was a great brand and wasn't a great fit for Crumb and Wire Sanctuary. So that was probably the first challenge that I had. Yeah. The agenda for change then grew from there was yeah. to, to make sure that we changed people's perception of what, what the National Trust could or should be doing here. Yeah. And then we had to go through a process over the next five years of working with government to put the um, to put the sanctuary back on a sound financial footing. Hmm. At that time, we were what we were called semi-statutory authority. We were still reporting to uh, the state minister for the government. environment. Hmm. So we had to go through the process of, of changes of governance, and that took the best part of, of the first five years. So there was hmm. a lot of community engagement. There was a lot of governance changes, hmm. and there was a, a little bit of uh, flying hmm. by the seat of your pants financial stuff. How well. successful were you in? Uh, look, uh, we, and how we, did you measure the success too? So, success is, uh, I mean, I've always measured success um, really in this company where we are now. We're a membership based organisation. So, if your membership is growing, you are doing something right. Mm. Um, so, really, you're yeah, making sure that you have a good connection with the community, that your volunteers are growing, that your financial membership is growing. Those are those sort of measures. But I'm very keen to move away from just measuring a company on financial success, particularly mm. a charity like this. Mm. So return on investment, yes, is important. Return on mission is particularly important for something like the National Trust. Mm. And in the industry that we're in, which is effectively the heritage tourism industry, it's return on experience. Mm. All of those things put together and uh, you can measure how, how well you're going. Yeah. Tell me about some of the challenges that you face with the National Trust. Yeah, when you first took on the job, mm. How, how was it? Like, was it in dire straits or did it need a lot of repair or how, how was it? Yeah. So I, I was shocked. I mean, I, I obviously come from the UK originally mm -hmm. and uh, National Trust is a huge brand over there, a successful charity over there. So I kind of assumed everybody knew what the National Trust was, uh, was about and that's not the case here in Queensland, in fact, mm -hmm. in Australia. So I had to re-educate myself about really what, what the public perception was of the National Trust. So... Um, uh, I then had to go about uh, trying to convince the people here, particularly at Kramawana, essentially, mm. that the National Trust eventually was going to be a, uh, a brand, a charity that was worth being part of. Because at that point, Kramawana essentially was far better known across Australia than the National Trust was. So why do we need this oh. big bureaucracy above us? Yeah. So there was a lot of uh, personal education, there was internal communication to work out. Mm. And then I had to stick to my guns and um, you know, show that that both could happen. We could grow Crown and Wildlife Sanctuary, that would be good for the Trust, it would be good uh, for Crown as well. So that's mm. uh, one of the big challenges that we've done. And how have you gone? How, uh, how look, successful? Yeah. 
it's it's uh, I'm proud of what we have achieved have achieved here as a team. Yeah. So I suppose our measures of success is that we have we have come out of a fairly difficult financial situation when I arrived, and mm -hmm. we, we, we got into three phases of, of survival, con consolidation, and growth. We, yeah. So we carefully worked our way through through that. Yeah. We we exited from government uh, effectively, and we created the National Trust Crumb of Wildlife Sanctuary combined brand. And now uh, we are uh, financially very stable. We've got, right. we've got capital in the bank. We've got a, a separate wildlife hospital foundation that's been formed in the meantime, which has helped that side of the business yep. as well. So uh, we're, in, we're in pretty good shape, mm. um, but we are ambitious to do more in conservation. So there's always more things that we'd like to raise money for. So um, yeah. Busy, okay. busy. Going on from that then, how do you, how would you think the average Queensland would perceive the National Trust? Mm, that's a good question. So the average Queenslander probably wouldn't at all, uh, but we are changing that now through good branding here at Crumbin Wildlife Century. So we have just had our, I think, fourth uh, Heritage Awards, National Trust Heritage Awards yesterday as it happens and we're really hammering home the question that we are no longer that organisation that just deals with old people in old buildings, yeah. which is perhaps what the perception might be for a few people. Yeah. We're not that organisation that yeah. stops things from happening in heritage buildings, quite the opposite. We, are, we have a broad church, we have uh, people from all walks of life, all demographics, all ages. Yeah. We're in the environmental game, we're in the built heritage game and we're in the cultural heritage game. Um, and I think events like last night with our social media, um, our partnerships are now beginning to change what people think of the National Trust. At least I'd like yes, to think so. Good. I understand obviously that the National Trust has many assets across the country and they seem to be far and wide. Mm -hmm. um, one of the questions I wanted to ask you was that, you know, with a, and I understand also you have quite a large volunteer workforce. Mm -hmm. With that volunteer workforce, is it hard for them to feel that they're part of the, the bigger picture um, because they are so far and wide and are stretched? And, yeah. oh, I don't think it's so much about distance, although no. I think that it's not unique to this organisation that, that there's a whole different mindset between the people in Brisbane and South East Queensland yeah. and North Queensland and far North Queensland. Yeah. Yeah, it's not unique to this organisation. No. Look, volunteers are your, your, they should be your best friends. Yes. You know, they're here because they love being here or should be. The, the best way that we've handled growing our volunteers is to treat them um, with respect and yes. give them uh, um, excellent training and good job descriptions effectively yeah. so that they really know what they're doing and make sure we get the right volunteer for the right place. It's not yeah. somewhere that you come and just do nice stuff. They have to be effective in the role and they have to be appreciated. Yeah. So uh, there is no shortcut to personal support so it's about it's about making sure that your your staff structure um, is adequate to give the volunteers the time that they deserve, quite yeah. frankly. So over the last 10 years, and, and you helped uh, with yeah. this, one of our best appointments was um, our HR manager, Jane yeah. Jameson, and uh, she's done a fabulous job, which is taking our volunteer work workforce here from 150 people that were really doing their own thing when they arrived to yeah. nearly 700 volunteers now wow. across the, the state. Most of them are here. <laughs> Um, and I like to think that uh, they are treated with respect and they respect us. Right. There is a tendency for them to do their own thing, yeah. uh, and that's mainly because we don't communicate with them. So it's, yeah. it's up to us to make sure that we support them and yeah. appreciate them. I was going to ask you about the encouragement of generating new ideas. Is that something you guys openly encourage from the volunteers? Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. not just the volunteers. We yeah. openly encourage it from uh, all our staff. Excellent. And again, the way to do that is just to make sure you've got the right managers that have the right yeah. communication skills. Yeah. So again, I've got an excellent team around there. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the general manager that took over from me here at Crumbin Wireless Sanctuary, Michael Kelly, is, hmm. he's got all the right tools and he's excellent at team building and, and, and encouraging staff to, yeah. uh, to step forward and um, I'm blown away actually at the ideas that come forward and Great. You know, as long as they all agree with me that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, going back to, to actual locations, where is the furthest location of the, one of the National Trusts? Here so uh, we're there? down here at Crumbin, about as far north as you can get is Cooktown. So uh, you know and to go. So we have at, at the moment what we call the National Trust James Cook Museum. Right. So Cooktown is the most amazing place. So yeah. it is, 
it's on the bucket list of most people, most Australians, to go up to Cape York at some point and pop into, they might pop into Cooktown. Yep. Look, it's where there's been 65,000 years of untouched indigenous occupation there. Mm. And then in, uh, in um, 1770, this chap called James Goodwin had hit mm. the reef and, and mm. he ended up spending 48 days there, mm. uh, mending his ship, waiting to go on. So we like to call it the 48 days that changed the world yep. because that's where they, they had the most contact with the indigenous people. So Kame Botany Bay, important, yep, but very brief period of time, no direct contact. Mm. Up there, 48 days, and it's where the first recorded act of reconciliation happened. So really important part of the world. Mm. Um, and our role now is to change the uh, the National Trust Museum, which has been in the title focused on James Cook, to more the impact of James Cook. So telling mm. the story before settlement, before arrival, what happened on those 48 days, which is incredibly mm. important and positive. Mm. First recorded act of reconciliation between the Europeans and the indigenous people. It didn't mm. happen anywhere else. Mm. Um, and then interweaving the story of the indigenous people all the way mm. through to the present. And mm. now in uh, 2020, mm. it's, it's 250 years since mm. Cook did his thing. Mm. It's 50 years since the Queen came to Cooktown mm. and opened our magazine. Can you imagine that? The Queen coming all the way to Cooktown. Mm. That's a four or five hour drive north of Cairns. Cairns. Fantastic guy. Yeah. Um, or a, a fantastic 40 minute yeah. flight from What a great Cairns. story. That's something great. that. And the average, again, knows, the average Queenslander wouldn't know that the story. The average Queenslander doesn't, the average, no. the average Australian doesn't. And it's. Hmm. It's so uh, uh, that's that's my most that's remote mission. property. Yeah. But there's there's about eleven or twelve properties on the way. So yeah. Going for a meeting in Cooktown is a big deal. It takes about two and a half days. So, <laughs> but well worth it. Well worth it. Yeah. Jonathan, I understand you've been recently appointed as a director of the Queensland Industry Tourism Board. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a big coup. Mm -hmm. um, and previously you were on the Gold Coast Tourism Board. Mm -hmm. What are some of the key challenges you've seen? And I know it's early days, but what are some of those key challenges seen with the tourism for Queensland and, and for Gold Coast, the local region? Uh, look, at, uh, look, we have been in this uh, boom period where we've seen fantastic growth in international tourism, particularly Chinese tourism. So we're seeing that tail off a bit, so we want to make sure that obviously we provide the experience and the infrastructure for, for the Chinese, but at the same time, make sure that we're covering all international markets. So it's really important that we keep strong in all international, New Zealand, Japan, India as an emerging mm. market, and of course the traditional markets of in Europe and the UK. Mm. What are the, the challenges um, are that we have to make sure that we provide the unique experiences, the authentic experiences that people will get out of their office in London, New York, Paris, whatever, yeah. and come to see, or Melbourne. And Sydney. Yeah. Remembering that on the Gold Coast, the the bread and butter of the Gold Coast tourism industry is still Australian. It's still yeah. people coming up the East Coast for their holidays from uh, Sydney and Melbourne. There is a tendency to spend a lot of time promoting to the international market, but we've yeah. got to make sure that we're looking after our own backyard. Yeah. Um, so uh, we need now to make sure that our public spaces, our infrastructure, particularly our transport, yeah is a hell of a lot better than it is at the moment. You don't yeah. want to come on holiday and sit in the same queues that you're going to sit in in Melbourne, exactly. London, Sydney. You want a better experience than we're currently giving people at the moment. So yeah. we're hoping that uh, the, uh, the success of the light rail will continue on down here to the Gold Coast Airport, I'd preferably right past my front door, <laughs> but also at the same time see the, uh, the momentum that seems to be building around the bid for the Olympics in yeah. 2032. Uh, create a much better infrastructure here for South East Queensland, but it needs to be investment for the whole of Queensland. So back to uh, what I'm, um, we've got to make sure that in my position here is uh, now on the state Queensland mm -hmm. Tourism Industry Council that, that I'm always thinking about the different areas and, and, and make sure that we particular emphasis on North Queensland, far North Queensland. Yeah. And, and there is, there are world class opportunities up there. Uh, and um, we haven't mucked it up yet. There's still a lot there that the world would find very attractive, and yeah. Australians would. We've just got to manage it sustainably, yeah. um, and with respect also, obviously, with the indigenous, yeah. um, indigenous population. Yeah. So whilst, I guess, it's been a little flat over the last couple of months in terms of the business climate, do you see things picking up for 2020? Do you see a, a bright sunshine on the horizon? Oh, I think 2020 is going to be amazing. 
Uh, flat has been, it's just been a bit of a pause after f also five years on the Gold Coast. We've been on an extraordinary journey. Obviously the Commonwealth Games last year was uh, uh, another reason to invest in this part of the world. And what was good about the Commonwealth Games was it was Townsville, Cairns and Brisbane. It wasn't just the Gold Coast. Yeah. So I think the uh, um, the future is bright as long as we keep uh, keep to our promises of, of infrastructure, transport, yeah. and so on. And that's good for the residents. It's good then for the tourism people to be able to uh, promote that. Um, twenty twenty is going to be important for us because it's the two hundred fiftieth year of Cook, and it's a great opportunity yeah. for us to do things that will empower Indigenous opportunity, give them a voice, which is good for tourism mm. and uh, good for Australia. Yeah. Lastly, I wanted to ask you. I talk to a lot of CEOs here on the Gold Coast, and a lot of those CEOs find it at times quite lonely at the top. Do you do you find that? And and if you do, do you have like a mentor or an advisor that you would go to in your hour of need? I, I've had some amazing uh, support and mentors, some of which you you employ professionally, mm -hmm. most of which are people like Paul Donovan from Gold Coast Airports and Gold Coast Tourism, who was the first person to call me when I arrived here 11 years ago and I, I know still that I can give Paul a call. There are many other people in the industry that have been amazingly supportive. Mm -hmm. But the best support you can have is your management team around you. Yeah. And you've been involved in recruiting a few of them, Jeff, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, I've got a great team around me and uh, we, we confide in each other, we trust each other and that certainly helps. Um, otherwise I'll go and take the dog for a walk on the beach. <laughs> Wrapping up, um, I'd like to thank you, Jonathan, for allowing us the time to speak to you about the National Trust and your experience as well. And we've certainly gained a, a greater, deeper understanding of what the National Trust is all about. And hopefully people will understand how important our heritage is and, and really want to be part of it as well. So thank you for your time, but That's also right. wish you all the best for the next 12 months and, yeah. and all the best for your Thanks. future. And remember, thank, thank you for getting me the job in the first place. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Good on.